Yes! Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. For those of you who are in the know of the Normal Boots community, November has kind of become a staple for a month that's been dubbed as Zelda Month. Now before everyone here yells at me for ripping off Peanut Butter Gamer, I'm just gonna put this out there. One, PBG is one of my best friends. Two, he created Zelda Month, it's his thing, and inadvertently, it's become this wonderful celebration of a franchise amongst our community. And three, more Zelda, yes! Welcome Peanut Butter Gamer to the show. Which one are we talking about today, Gerard? Well, usually I do all the work in these reviews, so I thought, you know what, let's share the responsibility this time around with each of us tackling and trading The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Ages and Seasons for the Game Boy Color. Whoa, 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 Jared and I helped with the Triforce Hero stuff last year. We did stuff. Yeah, I helped. Jared, what the hell are you doing in this video? I don't know. I heard my name called? Is that really how it works? I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Yup. Wait, really? That's how it works? Alright. Wow, Crendor! Hello? Hey, man. Hey. Uh... I just, I'm here. You just showed up? This is how it works? You just show up? Yeah, I mean, I packed and packed and everything, so I'm like... Where can I sleep? I mean, I don't really have a bed for you. I should've thought this out. Um... I'll just, uh... Can I have your banjo tooie? Yeah, you can have it. Sweet. I'm gonna leave now. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, friend to everyone. Certain video games out there demand a lot of their players. Some require special controllers or peripherals. Others expect the player to delve into other mediums like comic books or films in order to get the whole story. And then there are the games that force players to buy whole other games in order to enjoy the complete experience. Every now and then we're graced with twin video games that are meant to complement one another. A couple Mega Man Battle Networks have been released this way, and the Pokemon Company has built an entire empire on this practice. But the Legend of Zelda franchise is no stranger to the Double Dip either. At one point, back in the day, Nintendo was simultaneously developing three brand new Zelda titles which were designed to be played in any order. They would share characters, themes, mechanics, and the player's choices in one game would affect the details in the worlds of the others. But creating three codependent games was too hard, and so the trio became a duo. And that duo was ultimately unleashed on the world as The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, which both released for the Game Boy Color in 2001. The Oracle games went on to sell almost 4 million copies, earning their status as true Zelda classics. But if I must play through the two games, I'm gonna enlist the help of one of my best pals. Peanut Butter Gamer. Let's do this, man. I'm ready. I'm glad to hear that, because completing these two games won't be as simple as beating them each one time. In order to obtain every single item and defeat every single challenge, I'll first have to play through the Oracle of Seasons. Once that's done, I'll pass the baton over to PBG, who will continue my current playthrough on his copy of Oracle of Ages. And once I finish things up there, we're gonna play both games all over again, but in the opposite order. I'll start a new game of Ages, modified by our previous playthrough, completed and then finally pass the torch back to Gerard so he can cross the finish line in Oracle of Seasons. Now, if all of that sounds confusing, don't worry. It is. But we'll explain along the way. Handheld Zelda games are usually simple, good fun, but even though we're splitting up the completion duties, these games might still prove to be a pain due to the inclusion of the long fetch quests and grindy RNG mechanics. Things will probably go smoothly for the most part, but we are not looking forward to when these games inevitably devolve into repetitive busy work. But I guess you'll be a bit more used to it since you are the completionist, right Gerard? That's wrong. We're the completionists now. Uh... You have accepted the responsibility of completing the game with me, and soon you will also accept the pain! Um, is it too late to duck out of this? I forgot that you had some, uh, I had to, I had to sleep ever, like, at all. There is no time for sleep, absolutely not! Sleep is for losers. Okay.
With their simple, endearing stories and their classic aesthetics, the Oracle games are fully capable of punching old-school Zelda fans right in their nostalgic bones. And even for newcomers, they provide a surprisingly diverse and engaging adventure. Regardless of which of the two games you're playing, that adventure kicks off in basically the same way. Our ever-silent, ever-tunic hero, Link, rides his horse across the plains of Hyrule when he spies a castle in the distance. Upon entering and interacting with the Triforce inside, he's immediately immediately thrown into some kind of portal. But depending on which Oracle game you're playing, Link's destination will vary. In Oracle of Seasons, Link ends up in the world of Holodrum, where he quickly befriends Din, the actual Oracle of Seasons. But when she gets kidnapped by the evil general Onyx and imprisoned in a crystal, the Seasons of Holodrum start to go haywire, which means that it's up to Link to use the mystical rod of Seasons to bend nature to his will in order to save the day. Meanwhile, in Oracle of Ages, Link lands in a place called Labyrinthia, where he accidentally exposes Nehru, the Oracle of Ages, to the wicked sorceress Varen. Varen possesses Nehru and uses the Oracle's powers to travel back in time, seriously altering Labyrinthia's history and generally throwing things into utter chaos. So once again, Link's gonna take care of things all by himself, but this time using the Harp of Ages. Both premises are simple, evocative, and most importantly, they get us to the action almost right away. The two variations on the same theme allow us to see two completely different versions of similar events, which is kind of fascinating. And knowing that the two plots will eventually intertwine is pretty exciting. The Oracle games came at the tail end of the Game Boy Color's lifespan, so they were able to take full advantage of the hardware's capabilities. Nintendo squeezed some very pretty visuals out of that little handheld before it was retired, and these two games might just be the prettiest of them all. Albeit thanks to the main developers of the game, Capcom. The Oracle games would go on to solidify a steady relationship between Nintendo and Capcom that would ultimately lead to Capcom doing more games, including remastering some of the classics. The conceit of seeing an area from different perspectives, whether that perspective be another time or another season, is a clever way to add some much needed variety to a bunch of locations that would otherwise start to get stale. Being able to explore the past versions of certain areas and the wintry versions of others makes the games feel much larger than they actually are. And nothing jogs fond memories of classic gaming quicker than the Oracle games' music and sound effects. Hearing famous Zelda tunes rendered with a Game Boy Color sound card really displays is just how well composed these old tracks were. I mean, there's a reason why Nintendo keeps reusing them over and over. No need to throw that stuff out. If it's good, just keep using it. It's pretty clear that playing either one of these games by themselves would be enjoyable, sure, but something tells me it would be ultimately forgettable. Yet when you pair them together, they complement and reflect one another to become greater than the sum of their parts. Holodrum and Labyrinth make each other look great, like peanut butter and jelly. When was the last time you heard of someone eating a jelly sandwich? Actually, I like jelly sandwiches. Really? Yeah, they're great. But... I know, I know. You're a peanut butter gamer. I know, but I don't even really like peanut butter that much. What? Sure, Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages may be bite-sized, but they deliver a Goron-sized amount of classic Zelda content and fresh concepts. The scrolling screens, the towns full of side quest offering villagers, the pots that you don't own but you smash anyway, they're all here. And if you played The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, all of this feels right at home. But the very nature of the two games being connected to one another creates opportunities for some unique gameplay. For example, once you finish one title, many of your exploits will be removed remembered and even referenced by many of the other characters in the other title. Link has access to a lot of his trusty items and weapons from throughout Zelda history, such as the boomerang, the bombs, and the slingshot. But there are more novelty abilities available as well, like a couple of animal pals who can help Link during his adventure, including Ricky, the sentient tornado-punching kangaroo that you can ride. For crying out loud, why has Ricky never shown up again? In fact, why doesn't he have his own game series? A Ricky game series? I would play that. But the two most unique items of all are the ones that are themed after their respective games, the Rod of Seasons and the Harp of Ages. These things allow you to bend nature and time to your whim. The Rods of Seasons can cycle through all four seasons, and the Harp of Ages can transport you back and forth between the past and the present. And you're going to be doing a lot of nature manipulating and time traveling if you want to progress through the games. 
Can't swim across that lake? Merely change the season to winter and you can walk across the ice. Need to get past the pesky building that's blocking your way? Why not go back in time before that building even existed and then stroll on through? It's these mechanics that give these games a sense of identity within the Zelda series, as well as between themselves. But believe it or not, the games actually play pretty differently. After playing both games, it was pretty clear that Oracles of Seasons had a slightly stronger focus on combat, whereas Ages was way more puzzle heavy. These games aren't just clones of each other, they're wonderful precious snowflakes. And while we're on that topic, the dungeons in this game are top notch. They follow the usual Zelda formula that you would expect. Map, compass, treasure, mini boss, final boss, a few secrets in between here and there. But there's one dungeon in particular that really makes awesome use of the time bending mechanic. Halfway through the Mermaid Cave dungeon, you need to use the Harp of Ages in order to progress through it. I love this mechanic so much that I wish more dungeons in the game used it like this. One of the best and most memorable things to come out of the Oracle games are the items that are game specific. There's items that you can obtain and use throughout the games that will certainly help you on your journey. However, some of these items are only usable in Ages or Seasons. The same can also be said for items that have different level upgrades. For instance, in Ages you get the Rock Feather, which allows you to jump around and it's one of the best items in the game. But in Seasons you can get a level 2 variant that allows you to jump even farther over much larger gaps. And the best part, there are items that only appear in these games and never again appear in any other Zelda game to date, making the experience super contained and unique. The rock-solid combat and puzzles synonymous with Zelda are present and accounted for in both titles, and playing through them was as smooth as silk. But things started to get a little bit rocky once it was time to start hunting down items. Collecting key items like heart pieces and the weapon upgrades wasn't that much of a problem, but the Oracle's games have an unhealthy obsession with rings. There are several different kinds of magic rings in these games, and wouldn't you know it, you've got to collect them all to complete both games. The rings have different effects on Link when he wears them, but they're not all beneficial. Some rings will increase the damage that Link does, whereas others will increase the damage that he takes. Some rings will passively recover his health, and some will just straight up transform him into monsters. You know what, Link? Go ahead, you be who you want to be. I mean, hell, if you want to turn into your old retro Link self, you can go ahead and do that. That's tight. The problem with these rings is that collecting them all simply requires too much time spent grinding across multiple playthroughs. Many of the rings have fixed locations and are guaranteed to be rewards from various NPCs, but many of them can only be obtained by participating in pseudo-random activities. Like planting Gasha seeds and praying to the goddess that you get a ring once it sprouts. And then there are the rings that you can only get as prizes from Vazu the Jeweler for accomplishing tasks that are just too much to ask for, like killing 1,000 enemies. You may be fighting all the time in these games, but that still takes a long time. And then there's that ring that you can get only by collecting over 10,000 rupees. 10,000 rupees! Not only is this ring salesman bloodthirsty, he's also a goddamn crook. There's no way you'll collect 10,000 rupees by naturally playing, so when it came time to farm for them, the game slowed to an absolute crawl while we just dug up holes all over the place. It was like desperately looking for change underneath the couch cushion because you know the ice cream man is coming soon and you really, really want to finally try that horrible Sonic the Hedgehog ice cream thing. I still, I still have never tried that. I, I can't imagine that it's good, but I mean, you never know. Thankfully, linking the games together after each playthrough allowed us to share many of the items and power-ups that we'd already collected and carry them into subsequent playthroughs. Having a ring that triples your damage made the last couple of trips through these games a lot easier than the first time around. Linking the games together is critical to completing them since certain items are only available in the second, third, and fourth playthroughs. It can be a bit disheartening to know that you're playing through an entire game for the fourth time just for an item or two, but since this is Zelda we're talking about, things could be a lot worse. Scavenging for rupees, on the other hand, can leave a pretty bad taste in your mouth. Like hot dog burps. I'd say it's more like toothpaste and orange juice. All right, yeah, I could see that. Yo, this is kind of becoming a weird analogy. You started it. True, true, that is my fault. I take responsibility. When it comes to completing the Oracle games, there's tons to collect, do, and uncover. 
See, with Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, you had a link cable to allow players to trade Pokemon. With the Oracle games, however, when you've beaten them, you're given a unique password or a secret that allows you to connect your current playthrough into the next game. That means the choices you made in your first playthrough will carry over into your next journey in the second game. There's also a separate unique code for your rings, so you can keep stacking your ring collectathons throughout all subsequent playthroughs. This whole process is called a linked game. But before you go deeper into the secrets, let's talk about the true evil bosses. When you get to the end of your first playthrough of either Ages or Seasons, you need to take the unique code and plug it into the other game. Once you've beaten that playthrough, you can then fight Twin Rova, followed by Ganon immediately afterwards. These bosses obviously are staples from previous Zelda games. You can only fight these bosses after defeating either Onyx or Varen, so you need to go that extra mile to knock them dead. There's also tons of secrets and easter eggs that are uniquely spread out throughout both games. In addition to these main secrets, the game contains several other secrets that are necessary in order to get the most powerful items. For instance, if you speak to a lone Goron on the highest cliff in ages, he'll give you a password which you can then give to a big Goron in seasons. This password will allow the big Goron to create the big Goron sword for you, a two-handed weapon of destruction and death. One of the big secrets in this game is that you can actually get 16 full heart containers, unlike the traditional Zelda games. I'll admit, it's actually super confusing because you have to go back and forth, password to password, playthrough to playthrough, it's... It's all just a big, big mess, really. The last thing I want to talk about is Hero Mode and the Hero Dungeons. In the midst of your third and fourth playthroughs, you'll unlock Hero Mode, which gives you one extra heart upon starting and a shiny emblem on the menu screen. The Hero Dungeons become unlocked in your second and fourth playthroughs. These Hero Dungeons are the creme de la creme of difficult Zelda dungeons. They've got a lot of puzzles that are going to really make you think, asking you to really use all of your resources to the best of your ability. And what do you get for completing both types of Hero Dungeons? A level 3 Power Ring and a level 3 Armor Ring. Ah, great! Items that I could have used halfway through the game, and now that the experience is over, I just get to look at them in my great collection of 64 rings, and I have no use for them. Yay! Aside from a few boring sections, Oracle of Seasons and Ages are almost always pleasant to play, especially when someone else was there to share the workload. You know what, Gerard? If this is what completing games is like, then maybe I should do it more often. Don't be a fool, PBG. These games were mere child's play compared to what I've been through. Get out. Get out while you still can! Eh, maybe you're right, Gerard. While completing Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, there were 28 deaths, 58 hours of total playtime, 4 complete campaign playthroughs, including 2 hero mode playthroughs, 14 to 16 full heart containers acquired across all playthroughs, 64 rings collected, 2 hero dungeons bested, over 10,000 rupees farmed for, and... One peanut butter gamer saved from the wretched life of completing games. Run free, brother. Run and never look back. Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages brings back the kind of solid gameplay that one would expect from the Zelda franchise, let alone a Zelda portable. It faithfully recreates the familiar while also excelling at some of its more original concepts. It's only when the game starts asking you to collect every little thing that they start showing signs of weakness. And even though you don't get much at all for doing it, both games are more than worthy of your time. The pairing of The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages and Seasons is the perfect game set to get on your 3DS if you're going to be traveling for a long while. There's so much to do and see that is truly Zelda, and yet at the same time, there's a lot of crazy different unique stuff that's happening all the while in these games. However, this game is somewhat of a completionist's nightmare. Luckily, this game was very fun from start to finish, but there is a lot to look out for. Lots of mini games, and lots of secrets, lots of unlockables and rings, and there's so much going on in this game that it can be a bit overwhelming. So, with that in mind, guys, we give this game our completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! That's all time we have for today, guys, so please, as always, let us know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. A big thank you to PBG for coming back here on the show. And speaking of Zelda Month, make sure you check out my channel while I'll be talking about Zelda games throughout the entire month. Thanks for having me on, Gerard. I appreciate it.
Speaking of PBG, don't forget to check out our sponsor for today, ThePixelEmpire.com, who not only has unique video game merchandise, but he's got some special unique prints for PBG Zelda Month. You can check them out right here at this website. Go give it a look. Now if you excuse me, I'm going to go ahead and ride along with my animal friends. I have no idea what that means. I wanna take you for a ride.